morning. I'm Mark Emery. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to sum up my thoughts in a, in a single statement that my friends have heard before. And it's a quote from Herb Brooks, the 1980 coach of the 1980 Olympic hockey team. And he made this statement to his young athletes before they took the ice against the Soviet Union. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what we have here. Now we're not taking on the Soviet Union, but we are underdogs and we have a great deal of work in front of us. <coughs> I'm humbled to be sitting here with three heavy hitters, three of the more influential voices in our field of cognitive disabilities, Maggie Nygren, Marty Ford, and Peter Blank. We have a uh, series of questions that I'm gonna pose to our panelists. Uh, generally speaking, Maggie will focus on day-to-day -day implications of the declaration, Marty on public policy, and Peter, uh, as usual, focusing on merging legal cases and the right to the internet. We plan to continue this conversation about this statement of principles, the rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access. My first question, and we'll go in this order, if everyone doesn't mind, it will be Maggie, Marty, and then Peter for each panelist to address the question with their thoughts. Why is this statement of principles, this declaration of rights, so very important to Maggie? Well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna be fairly brief because I think that uh, uh, Marty and, and uh, Peter are actually gonna have more to say on this, but I would say that what's really important about the declaration at this time is that it's a restatement of existing rights um, that have been granted to all people um, under the lens of, you know, the times have changed. You know, technology that's available today wasn't available when many of the underlying uh, rights were granted to people. And it's important to focus that lens today to say, hey, wait a minute. These are rights that are available to everyone, including people with uh, cognitive disabilities. Uh, it's important to raise awareness it's important to get the message out. It's important to put that lens on this issue whenever we talk about basic, fundamental human rights. All right, I think I will add to what Maggie said. I think uh, uh, she's absolutely on target. Um, Mark, uh, we may not be taking on the Soviet Union, but when you're talking about public policy, you're taking on the United States. Um, it's sometimes very hard to uh, to move public policy, to move Congress, um, that, um, that uh, it is very, very important that we establish the goals for where we are trying to go uh, so that we can all be working towards the same end. Um, we have uh, difficulty in moving in the same direction if we are facing a lot of obstacles, and I know we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, um, in lots of conversations I've had with people in recent months, we know that employment is a huge obstacle to people if you can't get uh, into the internet, if you can't understand the application process, if you can't do the testing online uh, that is required these days in the employment world. Um, if you can't access um, the information technology uh, employment is basically a closed door to you, uh, and, that, and that is just one example of why, um, you know, information and technology has to be accessible to people. Um, but I, I, I did like your opening. Um, we're taking on the United States when we're having to go into Congress because it is not an easy thing to do, so we'll get into that in a few minutes. Our Constitution begins with the words, we the people, and it proceeds to set out a Bill of Rights in which individual issues of justice and liberty and freedom to participate in society are set out. These are not aspirations. They are basic civil liberties. This 
declaration is not a declaration of independence. It is a, and it's not aspirational, in my opinion, although David may disavow of me because of my more aggressive approach. Uh, it is establishing rights in law, and that means that they are redressable. That is, you can have a remedy in court. That means that they are enforceable. And it means that they can be articulated in a way which resonates with the basic civil liberties we all uh, are granted in this great democracy, regardless of whether this government is shut down or open, the Constitution is still alive. Now this document, uh, and, I, and I know we don't have too much time, I'll be brief, is really a statement, as Marty has said, with regard to the ability of all people to be free in this society, to participate autonomously and actively, and to participate in ways that are open to all people in this society. If the web is denied to people with cognitive and other disabilities, then that avenue for participation in, de in democracy is denied. And we are at a crucial point at the testing of those issues. The ADA is coming on its 25th anniversary, and there are other laws equally as important which have just celebrated their major anniversaries, the Rehabilitation Act, the Developmental Disabilities, Bill of Rights Act, and the law is just beginning to catch up in the area of civil rights with regard to access to our hyper-connected, real-time, knowledge-based society. And what I'm most pleased about is, and maybe in the subsequent comments can tell you, is that we must all remain vigilant, and there is a, many people in this room who are vigilant, because the community of people with cognitive disabilities has not been as aggressively represented on these issues that David talked about as other communities have. And I think this document lays down a marker which will allow us to our better articulate uh, those rights. Thank you. My second question to our panelists, what are the challenges and practical barriers to technology and information access? Okay, and this is where I get to be extemporaneous, David. We'll see where it takes us. I do, I do like it. Um, I, I see two practical challenges that I, I want to address, and one of them is, is quite frankly, market forces. Um, you know, new technology is developed or adapted in response to market forces, what people will buy. And I think that a challenge facing all of us is clarifying for the people that create these technologies that the market will buy. The other major challenge is, quite frankly, our own thinking on this. Um, you know, I think we've come to the point where people accept the notion of assistive technology as something deserving of public funding um, that should be delivered to people. And they think of assistive technology as something incredibly narrow and task-focused. And I would liken it to the notion of a uniform for work. Think of all the things out there for clothing, there's a uniform for work. Okay, well, we could justify buying that, that uniform for you, for you to go to work. And I'm not too concerned, because I don't think you're gonna wear that uniform outside of work. Pretty task-focused. Um, we tend to think about the purchase of technology, assistive or otherwise, as well, if you, can only, if you can use it for anything else other than work, we're not gonna buy it. I think we need to start treating technology, not as that uniform for work, but underwear. <laughs> that is something basic that you're going to wear maybe to work, maybe out for a night on the town. <laughs> you know, that it's basic, that we don't say it's task focused. It's something that you can use everywhere. The technology is not solely for the one purpose that I've agreed that you deserve to have it for you. It's for everything. And I think we need to get out of our own way um, on this um, and stop thinking about technology as assistive only in the sense of the specific task, like a uniform, but assistive in the sense that we all use our technology. Um, Enid had to remind us to turn off our phones, which I use for more than just making phone calls. It's like underwear. 
<laughs> How do you follow up on that? <laughs> yeah, I go back to Peter, right. Um, I think there are some, uh, some practical things that move into policy. Um, from a family perspective, there are some real serious uh, practical questions we would have in terms of uh, technology. And, and <clears throat> one question I would always have is, how do you make sure that the individual can keep their technology? If um, This is just a basic practical question. If you can't hang on to a good shirt um, and keep it in your possession, how do you hang on to something that's far more valuable? Um, that's That aside, uh, I'll return to Maggie's um, issues about um, technology and whether you are going to be um, using it every day for all sorts of purposes and not just the, the uniform for work. Can you uh, have technology that you can use day in and day out, including on weekends, or does it get locked away because the staff person who uses it with you isn't there at night and on weekends? Um, that's an issue that, that comes up. But it does get to some of the sort of policy ramifications of, of why some things are paid for and others are not. Um, and we know that uh, for quite some time it's been hard to get um, certain technology paid for through the Medicaid program because it was commercially available off the shelf and not um, medical use only. I understand that some of that is relaxing a little bit through the waiver program if the state has applied for um, the use of commercial off-the-shelf technology and allows it for individuals when they um, have made the case for that. Uh, I'm not certain that all states are using that um, or using it well, but it is apparently now available. Three of the organizations that are sponsors here, AAIDD, Anchor in the Arc, do have shared uh, public policy agenda. Uh, legislative goals, another term for it, that calls for um, commercial off-the-shelf technology being available to people through the Medicaid program, and we would push that even further, but clearly that's not enough, and that wouldn't meet all of the needs outlined in the declaration. Another um, barrier that I would identify is that getting um, broader improvements to access um, would most likely take some congressional action. And as you can well see, uh, Congress doesn't work very well together in a lot of ways. There are many stalemates, and there's a lot of partisanship. And anything that costs money these days is very, very difficult to pass. And so we are uh, constantly, we have, we have a huge agenda. <laughs> I forget how many pages this is, but right now I'm open to page 39. It goes on for over 50 pages. Um, we have a, a huge agenda of things to do. Um, many, many of them uh, have been in this um, document for a long time, uh, and we certainly continue to add to it and can expand this. But um, the question is, how much can we do that costs money? And um, so that, I'm just saying, is one of the barriers. But that doesn't prevent us from adding to our agenda, and we certainly will. This is a hard area, as David said. Uh, over the last three years, I uh, have finished, it's coming out next year, a book that was commissioned by the Coleman Institute and uh, with a foreword by David Braddock uh, coming out at Cambridge University Press. It's called Equality, subcolon for the academics, Web Rights, Human Flourishing, and Persons with Cognitive Disabilities. And with all books, it takes about three years to try to get it even close to right. You get five minutes of pleasure, you're on to the next assignment, and your mother buys about 12 copies, and <laughs> you, uh, you move on. Uh, this, this is a hard area. My hope is that, by the way, at the 50th Coleman Institute Conference, which this is easy, if this is 13 and it's 2013, there will be no concept of assistive technology or accessibility or usability. We will shift our thinking in regard to universal design and use by all. But it's particularly complicated in this area, and that took up a lot of time in the book. Uh, in the legal area, we've been fighting about what is equivalent access to the web, for example. In the Target case, we fought that for people 
with visual impairments. We're fighting it now for per people who are deaf in a case against CNN. CNN is claiming that, as I've said last year, when we won that case, by the way, at the lower court, and of course it's now appealed to the Ninth Circuit. It's not done till it's done. But CNN said if we would have to caption our website, it would violate our free speech rights because it would change the way we present the news, not thinking about whether or not people can have access to it. The reason why cognitive is so complicated is because in addition to basic access issues in the law, that you can turn on captioning, that you can hear the words, we're getting into content. We're getting into comprehensibility of web content or online knowledge. And once you cross from mechanical transformation, you talk to Siri on your iPhone and it can understand what you say verbatim, and now we're getting into ways to make it easier to use or simpler to comprehend. But mind you, cognitive disability is so broad, it's not necessarily related to standard levels of intelligence. It's related to many other ways of accessing information. The mother of all cases coming is going to be with the Rosa Parks, like we had in our prior cases, somebody in this room or somebody who's in your association who wants to work at a workplace and who can do the job, but just needs a little bit different ways of receiving that information or the content of the information or applying online, and the business is not willing to make that accommodation because they say it will alter not just the way they present the information, but the meaning of that information. That's going to be the hard case that we will take because we're going to the moon. Uh, and that will be the case probably coming in the next couple of years. The, these cases, I should add also, just lastly, are incremental. Somebody's holding up a five in the back. What does that mean? Five minutes, sorry. <laughs> That's Richard. <laughs> these cases are incremental. And the last thing I would say to you, just like Rosa Parks and race relations and gender relations, it's not the cases that are won, it's the cases that are brought that we have to fight. It's going to take 15 cases like it did in Target and now CNN of losing before we get to a decent principle. It's going to involve the right plaintiffs. And that means, once again, that it's going to involve within reasonable bounds, because I, I think David's right, you know, we're not going to be zealots about this in the way that you want to turn people off, but it's going to be the ways in which you guys stand up and say, we have a right to full and equal participation in society. And of course, information and technology and knowledge is one way to achieve that. I think that day will come, by the way, and I think that day will come sooner rather than later. But it's going to take both vigilance and diplomacy and also the lawyers a little bit. I'm sorry, Maggie, you've put this thought in my head about some chip embedded in my Fruit of the Looms. <laughs> I haven't been able to get rid of that. Here's our final question. Uh, what opportunities do we anticipate as we move forward and maybe any final recommendations you might have? Well, I think that the time is right. I think the question is, why this, why now? Um, we're riding the crest, uh, as, as Peter and Marty have mentioned, some uh, big anniversaries of landmark disability legislation. So the, the disability agenda, if you will, is uh, somewhat in the popular mind. We have a, a general population that is aging and starting to take advantage of uh, access things that were designed initially as accessibility aids. I draw your attention to the curb cuts, which benefit everyone, the sliding doors, with the little uh, pressing panel that benefit everyone. Um, and I think, quite frankly, the technology is uh, evolving, if you will, on its own and making a case for us. You know, you brought up Siri earlier. Uh, people are seeing the natural accommodations that benefit everyone that technology can provide. And it's that short leap from curb cuts for people who have mobility issues to benefiting everyone, to the Siri um, benefiting everyone. 
And I think that the opportunity uh, is, is perfect. This is the right time uh, to advance this declaration, push this agenda, get people thinking along those lines. I would uh, uh, suggest that we probably need to have some really good coordination between the, the really uh, advanced folks in technology and communication uh, and the really advanced folks who are doing the legal thinking, people like Peter, uh, and the public policy folks to talk on a regular basis, whether that's a, you know, uh, a forum through, through here or a task force that you convene or whatever, uh, so that we're all uh, together on a strategy and so that people, public policy people like me who got their first smartphone this year and don't know what to do when Siri tells them she won't make her phone calls, <laughs> Um, which happens a lot, um, you know, know what we are actually trying to do, um, you know, um, so that we are on a path together and not perhaps divergent or, um, you know, so that we, we are together in what we are attempting to do. I think, um, I think we, we are on a cusp. We, uh, this thing is moving so fast that uh, ADA would never have contemplated what we have today, and so what we, where we might be 20 years from now, we can't even imagine. I can't imagine where we uh, might be a year from now, technology-wise. So we have to stay in touch, and we have to keep updating ourselves so that we're not behind the times when we're um, trying to move policy. Okay, I wrote down four reasons why now, putting aside the technology uh, advances. One is, um, we can't be left behind. The legal and policy environments are moving extraordinarily quickly. Number one, the US Department of Justice is poised to uh, promulgate regulations with regard to web accessibility for people with disabilities. There is very little, if any, acknowledgement of people with cognitive disabilities at this moment in that draft. We hope that will change. Number two, the United States, to its credit, just signed on the Marrakesh Treaty which is a limitations to international copyright law treaty, which essentially is going to make e-books and knowledge, digital knowledge, much more transferable across borders, which will open up to developed and underdeveloped countries digital information. Number three, the CRPD, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, many of you know about, had its first decision involving equal access to technology against bank ATMs in Hungary. Little decision, very big impact, because again, it articulated the parameters of the convention. Number four, CVAA, remember those words, the communications and video, those letters, the Communications and Video Accessibility Act is coming online, most important law since the ADA was passed with regard to digital access. There is strong pushback against this law that we must be vigilant against. The uh, Sony, Amazon, a couple other big entities just filed a petition with the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which oversees the CVAA, to say that e-books should not be covered under this law because they're somewhat of a different animal than a tablet. Think about how if e-books do not have accessibility regulations on top of them. So all of that means, as we started with, we the people in the Constitution, our statement of rights, as Justice Ginsburg said, means all the people. And that's everybody here. Thank you. You're probably wondering, what can I do? Thank goodness I'm here to fill in the blank there. This is the opportunity we've been waiting for. Enid mentioned that as you walk out of this room in the next few minutes, you'll be handed a folder that looks something like this. And there's some very important information on the inside of that. But one of the two things that I'll speak about, one is a copy of the declaration, which will be suitable for framing. This is your to-do list. Hang that on a prominent place on your office wall for the entrance to your home. <laughs> Since you've hung that up, there's also a page in there with a link to an endorsement page on the Coleman Institute's website. Since you're hanging this on the wall already, pretty good idea to go there and endorse this document on the website. And here's where we begin the challenge. It's not enough to just have everyone in this room do that. 
There are well over 450 people who have registered for this conference because we have a common interest, and that common interest is a bright future for people with cognitive disabilities. The average Facebook user has over 120 friends. We use LinkedIn, Twitter, some of us blog. Here's the challenge. Go to that website, copy and paste that link to your favorite social media outlets and invite your friends and challenge them to join this movement. I'll guarantee you by tomorrow morning, my blog, Facebook page, Twitter account, and LinkedIn will have that link on it encouraging and challenging my friends to join this movement. If we all do our part, do the math, we have the potential for 50,000 endorsements in as few as 48 hours. And that will be just the beginning. We can do this. This is not difficult, but we all have to participate. That's your to-do list. We can create this moment in history. With that, I want to thank our panelists, Maggie Nygren, Marty Ford, and Peter Blank, and help me thank them for their comments this morning.